All right, class, time to begin. Our announcement about uh, homework two, uh, it's not an announcement, more, the, more of a reminder that homework two is available on Canvas. It's been there for a week. And I know some of you have already started. I encourage all of you to start soon. And, uh, you know, use uh, Canvas and uh, Office Arts and such things in case you have any questions. Or you can ask some questions now if you have any. Any? Yes. Um, let me remind you about the restriction. Yes, I will get to that. Thanks. I'll get to that when the lecture starts. Good catch. Any questions about the homework? Yes. How should we know if our receptions like like when we look at the results in the end? Mm -hmm. it's like, and they're all just kind of like sitting up there around like 90, 90, 90. Right. How do we tell it? Right or wrong? Is there else? At least mine could else in this place. So, well, what are they? What are all here? Like all the different variables. Oh, I see. Um, so, the variants are going to be somewhat close, not surprisingly. Uh, what I have found is averaging does not hurt performance. So, that's a one sided check. Another thing I found is with the right margin. If you choose the margin correctly, performance tends to get better, uh, like averaging uh, uh, in a similar sense as averaging does. So it's like tiny little bumps. And we're not talking about, you know, it's suddenly going to go from 85 to 100. This uh, one lesson, if you want uh, to take from this class, is to never believe any classifier that gives you 100% accuracy because it's more likely there's a bug than you encountered a data set that can be perfectly classified. Um, but you might see tiny uh, improvements. Um, and when I say tiny, uh, sometimes the improvements might be as small as half a percent or a third of a percent, you know, like 0 0.1. And these improvements, the, the, this kind of a change tends to uh, also shows up in, for example, research papers where different algorithms uh, are off by tiny amounts and the one that gets higher numbers tends to get published, but not just because it's got a higher number, but there's a, you have to do statistical tests to actually verify that there it's better. We won't be covering that in this, uh, you know, the statistical testing in this class, but hopefully you have, there's another class that does that. So then I don't want to enter, the way to verify our results, we should try our multiple Cs and verify over, like, if we look at it normally, then how do we need the higher? Sort of. The, the first sort of uh, check that you should do when you write your code, perceptron for in particular, or uh, any linear classifier, is construct a data set that's linearly separable and is tiny with two features. Your classifier should learn a, a hundred, get 100% accuracy. If that does not work, then you have a bug. Sometimes, you know, that might not work, but the bug is not so bad that uh, the on a real data set, you don't get you don't you may not be able to see it maybe you get 95 percent everyone else gets 98 so to be certain construct a tiny data set um, that is linearly separable that you know is linearly separable and verify that you get a perfect classifier and uh, i would encourage do this with two or three dimensions two or three features booleans and then what will happen is uh, you can even step through the code if you set, if you set the random seed you can step through the code and see that uh, the algorithm is doing the right thing. One type of a bug that this catches very quickly is uh, the presence or absence of the bias feature, for example. Other questions? Yes. So I, I I'm trying to kind of the 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 question that you're asking is different hyperparameters are getting similar average cross-validation accuracy. 
Is that right? And sometimes that happens. That just means that uh, the the learner is stable with respect to that hyperparameter. Um, I, I can draw a picture, for example. Imagine that there's some hyperparameter. Imagine there's some hyperparameter. Let's call that uh, H, and it can take. No, I, I use H all the time. Let's call that uh, N, and let's say N takes real values, and now I can measure for uh, different values of N some the cross validation accuracy, and maybe for this particular value of N, I get this point here. For something else, I get something more. Something else, I get more. Then it kind of stabilizes, and then it goes down. You may get something like this, and in which case you the question is which one of these do you pick? The kind of close, and maybe for a different random seed. So I'm going to draw this as a curve so that it's easier. Or maybe for a different random seed, you may get something like that. What that really means is your choice of hyperparameter does not really matter as long as it's in this band, or rather in this band. And uh, that, that also means that you know there are some hyperparameters that are clearly bad, like this. So maybe this choice here is really bad, but the rest of them are well, not not too different. So I would say pick one random seed because that's what I ask you to do. Pick one random seed and show us your cross validation accuracies and justify your choice of hyperparameters. It's not like we have the magic hyperparameters that we know that will work. Maybe for your random seed, uh, you know, th this phenomenon happens quite a bit. So you should expect this. Other questions? There are no questions about the homework. Uh, I want to talk about projects. So the class project details are now available on Canvas. I sent out an announcement yesterday. Um, the task that I've decided for the semester is uh, sentiment classification uh, using uh, of movie reviews. So you're given a movie review, and your classifier has to predict whether it's a positive review or not. This is a well-studied task in uh, natural language processing. There are many data sets out there. And uh, there's one popular data set from 2005 that uses movie reviews from Rotten Tomatoes. And there's a binary classification task. task. So one means positive, zero, zero, or minus one, I can't remember, is negative. And uh, this is a, a very well studied data set. Right? It's from 2005. So it's like almost 20 years old now. Uh, maybe some of you have not even seen some of those movies. Um, the, the project is uh, uh, divided into a, you know, ask what you, you need to do, uh, consists of several milestones. And uh, the first one is due next week. I'll tell you what it is in a minute, but uh, I just want to talk about these milestones uh, and what we have given you for the project. So the input to the classifier is a movie review. But of course, you need to convert the movie review into a feature set. We've done that job for you. We've done not one, but we've given you three feature sets and we've hidden the movie reviews because we don't want you to know what the reviews were uh, because this is a popular data set. So we are giving you three feature sets uh, and the, the document on Canvas gives you details on what those features are and such things. And uh, you have to use your, your job for the class project is uh, to train at least six different classifiers or six different models on these on this data using at least two of these features. And uh, there are a few rules. Uh, you should read the document for the rules. In terms of milestones, um, or uh, in, sorry, before the milestones, in terms of logistics, the first, we, we are using Kaggle. Uh, how many people have used Kaggle or before? One or two, about three, four, a few. How many people have heard of Kaggle? A few more. So Kaggle is this website where uh, that hosts machine learning competition, where you can, you're given a data set, you can download the data set, and you're given a training set and maybe a test set, and uh, the labels for the test set are hidden. And uh, you build your model, you give labels for all the test sets, there's a standard format in a CSV file in a, in a particular format, then you upload it to Kaggle, and Kaggle, what it does, it's, it splits the test set into two parts. One part is the public part, the other one is the private. The public part, uh, both of them are evaluated. 
The public accuracy is used to put you on a leaderboard that you can see. The private accuracy is used to put you on a leaderboard that only I can see. Uh, that way you don't overfit on the leaderboard. That way you don't end up training your classifier based on the leaderboard. And uh, trust me, that has happened. Not in the class, but uh, uh, in the wild. So this leaderboarding is just kind of for fun. Um, unless there's like a strong petition that I should do something about the top maybe 10 positions in the leaderboard, maybe half a grade, a letter grade bump. But uh, if if you have reservations about that or opinions about that, let me know. You don't have to do it now. Um, what we do with, what, what, what we will do with Kaggle is you will get a data set, the training set. There'll be a test set, like in your homework, that you can evaluate your models on. There will be another test set. We are calling it something like the anonymous evaluation set, where we have hidden the labels. So the task has zero and one, and for the anonymous evaluation set, all the labels are minus one. Neither it's not valid uh, label. Those are the ones where you need to take your best model, make your predictions, and uh, upload the predictions to Kaggle. And you'll have to upload at least six different models using at least two different data, two different feature sets. Pick your favorite. The, out of those six different uh, models, five of those uh, should be at least uh, code that you wrote. So you can use anything that you implement in your homework for your project. One of them can be a library. You don't have to. At least five have to be your own code. The sixth one also could be your code. It's up to you. Um, and there are like some other uh, technicalities that I've written in the document. Uh, go over it in detail. It's not too long. Um, you might read it faster than it took me to write it. Um, and uh, the, the, the other thing that I want to mention is the project has a bunch of milestones. There are four milestones. The first milestone, which is due one week from now, and I know it's the same day as the homework, but don't worry. This is so simple, this work. It's mostly for making sure that the next three milestones are easy. This is hopefully going to take you about 20 minutes. First milestone is uh, the following. Create an account on Kaggle if you don't already have one. Use the link on Canvas to uh, get invited to the project. Create an account on Kaggle. Download the data. Uh, there are two kinds of data that you need to download, all the training and test data. And we've also given you a dummy uh, predictions file just to show you what the prediction format should look like. That they, We've given you two dummy predictions. One of them is all positive. One of them is all negative. All positive, as the name suggests, labels all examples or in the value, anonymous evaluation set as positive. All negative says everything is negative. Take the all positive uh, uh, file and then find the place where you need to upload it on Kaggle, upload it on Kaggle. Kaggle will come back to you and tell you this is the accuracy of your predictions. Now go back to Canvas and tell us what your Kaggle username is and what your uh, what accuracy the dummy submission gives you. As you can imagine, this is very simple. Create an account, download a file, upload it back, and enter two things on Kaggle, on Canvas, sorry. Any questions? As you can imagine, this is mostly for logistics. This is mostly to make sure that you have an account on Kaggle and that I know what that account is when I go grading. So, I want to remind you that the deadline for this is also next Thursday, the same as the homework. But uh, I, I was kind of conflicted on whether I should put this on the same day as the homework. Eventually, I kind of did because this is so little work. You can just do this while watching TV or something. It doesn't really need uh, any uh, thinking. Any questions? Yeah. For models, we use multiple algorithms. Yes, you can, um, but you should. Uh, so, for instance, you I, I don't want you to say um, perceptron with hyperparameter value learning rate equals 0.1, perceptron with learning rate equals 0.2. Those are not two different models. Those are the same learning algorithm. Uh, I don't want decision tree with a depth two, decision tree with a depth three, and you do, do that six times and then say project done. No. Um, each different submission, I want at least five different algorithms. Five, uh, six different algorithms, sorry, of which 
at least at most one can be an external library like use pytorch use you know go crazy do whatever you want or not i mean it's up to you any other questions um read the document on canvas uh, and see if you have questions yes So at the end, okay, so the I said the project has four milestones, right? So the first three milestones are very simple. You just upload things to Kaggle, uh, to, um, Kaggle and submit like something on Canvas. For the first milestone, the thing you submit on Canvas is just a little questionnaire. For second and third, you need to, you'll have to write a short report, a one-page document that just says what you've done, what your plan is. The final milestone is the final project submission where you have to submit, um, a somewhat longer report and your code and uh, we'll kind of try to look at your code and see if it works and uh, see if some you know, will uh, with some probability run your code and see if it gives the same results as Kaggle does and so on does that clarify things yeah. we want to run your code we would like to run your code. We would like to read your code also. Okay. So please, um, you know, you, you can use the same rules apply. Any uh, any language that's available on uh, CAD, any libraries that are available on CAD. And in fact, the same rules for late submissions also apply for the project. You get one day more if you miss the day. Deadline, you can go one more day and you lose 10% of the points. Okay. Um, like I said, read the instructions, see if you have questions, uh, any thoughts, any suggestions, come to office hours or use uh, Canvas. We can chat about it. I want to get back to where we were in the last lecture, and I would like to start off with actually a correction. So in the last lecture, The last lecture I mentioned that uh, uh, there was an error in the slide. Turns out the error was not in the slide, but in what I said. So let me explain. Uh, so remember the perceptron algorithm. Um, I'm, I'm not writing the whole thing down. I'm just writing the innermost loop. You have for x comma y. We have some examples in the data set. If y W transpose X is less than equal to zero. In the class, I said, this should be strictly less than, the slide said less than equal to, I said, no, that can't, that's not right. It's a, there's a subtle bug. It should be strictly less than, I said the exact opposite thing of what is correct. It should be less than equal to, um, and the reason, and uh, thanks for Samir, Jordan, and Manya uh, for pointing it out in the office hours. So we have our initial weight vector is zero. And uh, imagine that you start, imagine that this thing here was actually strictly less than, not less than equal to. So what happens now? Can someone take a guess? What happens? Like let's take let's take one example x one, which is some vector, and a label y one, where one is plus or minus. We don't care. What happens with the first example here? What is y times w transpose x when w is zero? Okay, and this inequality, which is strictly less than, is never not going to be satisfied. No mistake, no update. So w stays zero. And you run this over the entire data set, you do all the stuff over millions of epochs if you want, you will return a zero vector. So this is a bug that happens very often. And I demonstrated it in the class by confusing myself. Uh, so don't do that. It should be strict, it should be less than or equal to. Okay. Less than or equal to what happens? The first example, literally the first example, 
what you get is y w transpose x is zero. So you have this equality here. So the first example always triggers an update. And then the algorithm continues. Okay. Yes. Also say that that Something yeah, if, it, if you initialize the weight vector with anything but zero, that bug doesn't happen. Um, the initialization with zero is better because we are going to prove the theorem using that. Um, it's better for that reason and only that reason. In practice, it doesn't matter. In practice, it's not going to matter because it's going to converge no matter what. Other questions or comments? Okay, so I want to go back to where we were. The last lecture, we started looking at this perceptron mistake bound theorem. This is a theorem from Novikov and Block. I want to restate the theorem. I stated it once in the, at the end of the last lecture. I want to restate it and then uh, uh, walk you through the proof. It's a very simple proof. So is the contrast clear? Should I turn some lights off? Is this okay? People in different corners of the room. Okay. So we have a sequence of uh, examples, x1, y, y1 x2, y2, and so on. And uh, the, each training example is an n-dimensional vector here. So xi is a list of i1, xi2 of n numbers. And we're saying that uh, each of these xi has a norm that is less than or equal to some number r. What that means is, remember, this is a vector, right? So we have this two dimensional space here, for example, and maybe this is one data point, this is another data point, this is one, this is one. And I can always find some number r such that the circle with radius r covers all the data. Right? So this is uh, the farthest point defines the farthest point from the origin defines the the length the maximum distance of that vector from the origin so r is just the name i'm giving to that distance every label we are working with binary classification and we are in the perceptron uh, algorithm the labels can be minus one or one now um, this is the uh, point about r um, it's not supposed to be it this is not an assumption the saying that xi is less than or equal to r is not an assumption, but it's just a statement of fact. I'm just saying that the farthest point is at a distance r. Now, suppose there is some uh, a unit vector, a unit vector called u, which means what is a unit vector? It has a norm 1. Now, for every example xi, yi in the data, we have y i u transpose x i is greater than or equal to some positive number gamma. What does that mean? The fact that it's positive means, well, this is strictly greater than zero. That means this thing is greater than zero. Y w y u transpose x is greater than zero for every x y means that for every x y, the the sign of the y and the u transpose x is going to be the same. If y is positive, u transpose x is positive. y is negative, u transpose x is negative. So that's the first point. For every x, y, y times u transpose x is positive, which means the data set is linearly separable. And u is the weight vector that perfectly separates it. We don't have it, but this is an assumption. Suppose there exists a weight vector u, such that it linearly separates the data. But we're asking for a little bit more. We're saying it's not just linearly separating the data, it's linearly separating the data with some margin gamma. Is this an assumption? Or is this just a statement of, just like this R, I could say, find the point that's closest to the hyperplane. So I have this 
nice i have a bunch of say pluses here and a bunch of minuses here i could just say you know this data is linearly separable by u and i'm going to just find the point that's closest and that u y u transpose x with a, because u is a unit vector that distance is gamma for every other point this distance to that hyperplane is more than gamma right not so much an assumption as it's a property of the data for this data set there is uh, the 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 ideal weight vector u that perfectly separates the data uh, places a, uh, is at a distance gamma from the closest point questions about what i have said so far now it may seem like i'm introducing i'm just throwing a bunch of notation at you it may also seem like i'm i'm just unnecessarily introducing all these greek letters when uh, uh, to say something that is really easy this middle block is simply saying there's a data set it's linearly separable by some a hyperplane whose weight vector is u i can make the length of u whatever i want without loss of generality i'm calling it a unit vector i'm just dividing it by the norm so i have a unit vector i'm taking the unit vector for that hyperplane unit normal for that hyperplane and then for that unit vector i'm asking what is the data point that is closest to the hyperplane and the distance of that is gamma so every other point is at a distance of at least gamma questions so far there's only one assumption the assumption is this bit here suppose there's a weight vector that perfectly separates the data now it turns out that the gamma is a useful concept because if gamma is really really large that means so i'll show you two examples so imagine that uh, we have a line and i have some this is one data set let's call this data set 1 and i'm going to draw the separating line here this is one data set call it d1 i have another one now d1 is clearly in in a in a in a in a subjective way d1 is a harder distinction to make because the pluses and the minuses are very close to each other d2 there's like a big gap you just plot a weight vector there with high, you're going to find the classifier so if this gap gamma if this gap is large you expect the learning problem to be easier and that's why this gamma is a natural complexity I, i gave it a name for this one so let's call this d2 so naturally uh, uh, gamma becomes a complexity parameter for that decides how hard it is to learn you would expect that if gamma is small learning should be harder if gamma is large learning should be easier mm -hmm. questions about this that intuition what the perceptron mistake bound says here is that in this situation if you have a data set that is linearly separable with a margin gamma the perceptron algorithm will make no more than r square over gamma square mistakes on the training data so as the data gets larger namely r is bigger learning gets harder because r is in the numerator there as the data gets farther and farther from the origin the learning becomes harder because uh, you need to there's more room in some sense you can you know you might be able to find a hyperplane that does not you you might take a little more effort to find a hyperplane that separates the data if gamma becomes smaller the positive and the negative classes are getting closer to each other so it takes more effort and more effort means in this case number of mistakes so this is a intuitive uh, i mean this this is not the only expression that has those properties but at least you can justify r square over gamma square saying that as the data gets bigger and uh, as the norm of the data gets bigger and bigger learning becomes harder 
as the positive and the negative examples get closer and closer, learning becomes harder because gamma is in the denominator. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Because it's not just that we are finding the direction, but we are also rotating the hyperplane and it sweeps a bigger arc farther away. Uh, the, the, a small angle change covers a larger distance as the data gets farther. So let's clear this picture. So imagine that I have, a, this is my origin. I can't draw. I think the trick is, this is my origin. And uh, let's say I have, this is my hyperplane. Let's say the data, the line goes to the thing. So I have a point here versus I have a point here. Now, in order to change, to get this right, I have to, a small change in the angle might allow me to cover uh, this distance, but the same change in angle covers the lesser distance as the data gets farther away. Another way of thinking about this is if your data were normalized to the unit ball, then the R disappears. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a technical point here if what you what would happen if you had not been a unit vector. Once we go through the proof, you can come back to the slide and try to prove what's written at the bottom. I'm not going to worry about it right now. But this this uh, theorem is saying something rather simple, at least uh, uh, something that is easy to state. Suppose we have a binary classification uh, task and a binary classification data set um, with n dimensional inputs, with you know, with uh, whatever it does, the dimensionality doesn't really matter here in this. Uh, at this level of abstraction. And suppose the data set is linearly separable, meaning there exists some binary classifier, some linear classifier that can perfectly separate the data. Then the perceptron algorithm will eventually stop making mistakes. After making those many mistakes, the perceptron algorithm will perfectly classify every single example that comes along its way. That's the uh, that, that's the intuition. That's the, intu the meaning of this theorem. And to me, this, when I, this, you know, if you think about this, to me, this is a remarkable theorem. We're talking about real numbers. Uh, and I think so, someone mentioned when we were talking about the halving algorithm, how is it possible that uh, we can prove mistake bounds when we have real numbers? Because there are an infinite number of them. So we have, we are talking about the weight vectors being real numbers. And yet, after making a finite number of mistakes, the perceptron algorithm is going to stop making mistakes, provided the data set is linearly separable. One of the ways to appreciate a theorem before is to kind of throw out all the math and try to get an understanding of what it's really saying. What does it mean? You know, the, 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 the notation is there to make everything concrete, but what it really says is that perceptron is going to stop making mistakes on linear, linearly separable data. Yes, that's right. It would have perfectly separated the positive and the negative. And uh, yeah, basically. That's right. And that's, by the way, this is the theorem that's going to help you debug your code. If you construct a data set that's linearly separable, powered by this theorem, your, your implementation of perceptron should find a linear classifier. Otherwise, uh, either your implementation is wrong or the theorem's wrong. We know the theorem's not wrong because we're going to prove it. Let's prove it. Um, let's uh, to set things up. Just a reminder. Um, this is the perceptron update at the top. You have an input x i y i, and then you see if the sign of x i, a uh, sign of uh, w transpose x i, which is the dot product of w and x i, is. Uh, uh, not equal to the true label y, y i. If it is not equal to the true label, then you update your weights as y w t plus one is w t plus y i x i. 
I'm assuming that the learning rate is one. Uh, that's why I don't have an R here. And uh, also assuming that the initial weights are all zero. Um, and two other things just to from the statement of the theorem that we also have is that all examples are contained in this large ball of size R, of radius R. In other words, for every example, the norm of Xi is less than or equal to R. The other thing that we know from the statement of the theorem is that the data is separable with the margin gamma according to the true weight vector, which means Y times U transpose Xi should be greater than or equal to gamma for all uh, Xi, Yi. This is just one slide summary of what we know so far and what we have assumed. The only thing that we've really assumed here is that uh, uh, is this thing here that the data is linearly separable. And we, for now, we are uh, because the, I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. But if you set your initial weight vector to zero, then the learning rate really does not matter. And I think I mentioned this in the homework also. Uh, Want you to think about that and convince yourself that the mechanics of the algorithm makes that happen. So setting the learning rate to one does not, is not an assumption. It's not something that we are compromising on because when the initial weight vector is zero, the learning rate doesn't matter. Before we move to the proofs, any, oh, there's a question. Um, the dot product, why? Ah, this is a good question on Zoom. The question is the dot product of y times u transpose x translates to the projection of x on the unit vector. How is it the distance from that hyperplane? Well, the distance, it is the distance from the hyperplane because we know that this, the, what's the distance of a line from a point? It is u transpose x divided by the norm of u and the absolute value of this. Well, if I know what is the absolute value, the absolute value is simply saying if u transpose x is positive, then we may keep it positive. If it's negative, we make it positive by multiplying by minus one. Why u transpose x does exactly that. If u transpose x is positive, then why u transpose x, and y is also positive, the data set is linearly separable. So if u transpose x is greater than zero, because the hyperplane is correct, y is also greater than zero. If it is less than zero, y is also less than zero. So these two things are identical just for this data set. And because the vector u is a unit vector, the norm of u is equal to one. So we are left with just y u transpose x. I hope that answers your question. Uh, if the question didn't make sense, revisit the thing on the video. Uh, and I think the answer also makes sense. I hope it does. If not, please. Uh, Ask me a question. Anyone? Okay. Um, if there are no questions, let's just move ahead to the proof. The proof consists of three steps, and each step by itself is rather simple. Uh, the first two steps here are essentially two claims that we are going to prove. If you want to be fancy about it, instead of calling it a claim, you can call it a lemma. Uh, but you know, let's just call it a claim. Um, the first claim is that after making p mistakes, the dot product between u and the weight vector that we are updating is going to be more than uh, t times gamma. So to see that, let's actually look at the update. This is a quantity that we are going to track y times the W transpose, uh, Y, uh, not Y, U transpose weight, uh, the weight vector. So the dot product of the, the true hyperplane, the, of the true operator, and the weight vector that we are trying to learn. It's going to be more than T times gamma. Well, let's, what happens when you update? WT plus one is WT plus Y XI, when there's a mistake, right? I can take the, U transpose this is U transpose this plus, right? So I'm just taking, when there's an update, um, the, the this is just from the definition. This is literally from the update rule. But the question to, uh, the point to note here is, well, there are 
there's one interesting thing to note. We have this quantity here, y times u transpose x i, y i, right? We know by the statement of the theorem that y i times u transpose x i is at least gamma. The theorem tells uh, says that this quantity, this, this distance, this, this is the distance of the point from that true hyperplane. And we know it's at least gamma, so I can just say uh, this, I can, I can make say that uh, u transpose w, wt plus one is u transpose wt plus gamma, it's actually more than that quantity because this is at least gamma. What I've done here is uh, just, you know, symbol manipulation. I just took one expression that I already knew, which was y u transpose x i is at least gamma, not zero, but gamma. And just uh, notice that I'm, this is the same quantity as here. Yes. This is when you're making a mistake. U is fixed. Y i and W transpose x i will be opposite. U is the oracle weight vector, the true uh, classifier which never changes. Y times W transpose x i will always be negative, and we will use that fact later. But uh, notice that there's something interesting here. Uh, if I remove all of this, this is something. Uh, this is the t plus one element of a sequence. This is the t element of a sequence. Instead of calling it u transpose w t plus one, let's give this thing a name. Let's call this uh, uh, a t plus one. And that means this would be a t. So you have a t plus one is greater than or equal to a t plus gamma. And this is happening t times. So what can I say about a t plus one? And what is a zero? U, U transpose w zero. The initial weight vector is the zero vector because we started with the zero vector. The initial weight uh, for the classifier is the zero vector. So we're starting with zero. So what can you say about a t plus one uh, or a t even eventually? Well, I know that a t is greater than or equal to And all the way, a one is greater than or equal to, right? I can just uh, uh, telescopically cancel or whatever you want to call it. Just add this up. This is just simple uh, induction that tells you that uh, u transpose w t is greater than or equal to t times gamma because there are t times you are adding the gamma. Any questions about what's going on here? And do feel free to ask questions, right? Um, I strongly, strongly believe that the way to learn math is, there are many different ways of learning math, but one way of not learning math is to watch somebody else show it on a slide. Like a sure shot way of making sure that totally goes over. So kind of, uh, I, I encourage you to engage with it and think of questions or try to convince yourself that this is right or convince me that this is wrong. Yes. Sure. So we had, shall I get rid of the A thing? I, I did that mostly because I'm lazy. I'm just going to use new transpose, uh, transpose WT plus one is greater than or equal to U transpose WT plus gamma. This, are you okay with that? Okay. But I could have applied the same logic to u transpose wt is greater than or equal to u transpose wt minus one plus gamma and transpose wt minus one. Or so, yeah, let, let me do this in a different way. So I'm going to just use wt. So do you agree with this? Okay. But I know that u transpose wt minus one is greater than or equal to u transpose w t minus two plus gamma, this whole thing plus gamma, this comes from here, which is greater than or equal to u transpose w 
T minus 3 plus gamma plus gamma coming from here plus gamma coming from here and so on. Every so is equal to U transpose W T minus T plus there are this is three gamma, this is two gamma, T gamma. But I know that W, this is just W0, U transpose W0 plus T gamma, but W0 is a zero vector. So the dot product of the zero vector with U is zero. So this is, uh, this means that this is equal to just T gamma. And does that make sense? Cool. Other questions? The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, if you feel like you don't understand, I guarantee that there are 10 other people who don't understand. So that means that if you ask a question, you're helping 10 people. Like get your good credit badge for today. Yes. Yeah, so we had actually U transpose W T plus one greater than equal to, I don't know why I, I just subtracted one from the index. I went one step backwards and uh, that's, yeah, that's it. Other questions? So this is, this takes care of our first lemma, our first claim. The second one is a similar, it, it, it kind of behaves in a similar way. The second one says, after t mistakes, if I consider the norm of the weight vector that I'm learning, it's going to be less than t times r and t times r square. And I'm going to prove that. Well, it's the same process again. The weight vector, this wt plus 1 is simply wt plus yi xi uh, because the learning rate is 1. Right? The, the squared norm, this is not, sorry, uh, did I say norm of the weight vector? The squared norm. The squared norm of that is simply the squared norm of this sum just by definition of this update. Well, I can expand the square. So I get wt square plus xi square plus twice um, yi w transpose wt transpose xi. So, so far, so good from here to here. But now we have uh, an interesting object. We have this quantity here. What do we know about that? Why is it negative? So the only time we make this update is when the sign of W transpose XI and the sign of YI are opposite, which means it doesn't matter what YI and XI and W are because we were we are talking about what happens when there's an update. We know that this quantity that I've just shaded here has to be negative, right? So we have two things and a negative, and we are adding a negative quantity. So I can say that this is less than or equal to the norm of WT square plus the norm of XI square. Did I say less than? No, greater than. Less than, right? Thank you. Uh, that was a awake check for you all. So, okay. Now there's something more. We also know that this quantity, what can I say about that one? Someone else. Uh, why we did not miss out on it. What we know is why I W transpose X I is strictly is in this case, it's negative. In this case, it doesn't matter, right? So if it's negative, that means, wait, what do you mean in the, oh, from here to here? From here to here. Yeah, okay. So I can expand the square. That's good catch. Uh, good question. So I have WT square plus 2YI W transpose XI plus YI XI squared. But YI, remember, is a number and XI is a vector. So I can take this quantity out, but it has to be squared. So I have YI squared xi, the norm of xi squared. But yi is either 
minus 1 or 1, which means y i square is 1. That's a subtle point and that uh, is important. Okay, so now we got rid of this, got rid of all this, got rid of the y. And one of the nice things I can do that I cannot do on a whiteboard is actually move these things around. So we have this. Yeah, it, it, strictly less than is good enough. Uh, I mean, it, it is technically strictly less than, but less than or equal to is good enough. Yes. Because it's possible that W might be the zero vector in the first iteration. Okay, what can I say about this quantity here? What do we know about? Yes. That's right. We, we st the statement of the theorem says every data point, every xi is contained in this large ball of radius r. So we know that xi, the norm of that is less than or equal to r. So the norm square is less than or equal to r square. So I can apply another inequality. So Oh, I moved it too far. This is also, so we know that this quantity is less than or equal to R square. So we have the norm of W square plus R square. So, so far so good. So once again, we have this sort of a recursive definition or a, a chain of inequality. So you have some, the teeth item, is less than or equal to the, the t plus one the item is less than or equal to t the item plus r square. Yes. So uh, why did you lose the middle term between the second and third step? Uh, this term here? Yes. Because that is always negative. So I'll give you an example. So imagine that this, this quantity is positive, right? So let's say that this is 10. Let's say this is minus five and this is four. So 10 plus 10, minus 5 plus 4 is always less than 10 plus 4 because I'm I'm, ta I'm taking away some quantity. Y times W transpose Xi is a negative number because the only way in which we would have made this update here is if um, here, if, uh, oh, you can't see the zoom, can you? The only time this update happens is if the sign of this and the sign of this are different, which means the product of that is a negative number. And so we are adding a negative number will reduce the value. So this value has a negative number added to it. This quantity has a negative number added to it, which means it's going to be less than this. Does it make sense? If not, don't let me go further. It's less than this is. Back to the quantity is less than that. Yes. If you were to write this up in code, how would you map the slender that they call these like length up? Like the big two plus one square is less than two plus one, or sorry, which implies that it's less than two. Oh, I could, I just did that here. Something like that. Okay. Yeah. Or I could just say by induction, and uh, that's really what I'm doing. So just to kind of uh, circle back, the middle term is lost because uh, the update happens only when y w transpose x is less than or equal to zero. And uh, the last term is uh, uh, strictly less than r squared. So um, we can combine all of those and get something like this. This quantity is less than the norm of WD squared plus R squared. W0, the initial weight vector is a zero vector. So we will eventually get by induction, essentially the same sort of sequence of steps that we did before will tell us that uh, the norm of WD squared is less than or equal to T times R squared. Once again, question. Yes. 
Yes. The next one. So you have WT square is less than or equal to. So I'm going to do this in a different way now. Let's do W2. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, but I also know one more thing. I know that this quantity is zero. So that goes away. Now what I can do is just add them all up. So when I add them up, this cancels this, this cancels this, this cancels this, this gets cancelled. So the only thing that's left here is this thing here, the zero, and we have all the R. So you have the norm of WT square is less than or equal to T times R square. <laughs> okay. This is basically induction, right? I mean, it's just telescopic summation or it's another way of presenting the same thing. Okay. Now, here's the thing. I think, by the way, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but we're practically done with the proof. Um, you might disagree. What do we know so far? From the first claim, we know that after T mistakes, the dot product between U, the true vector that separates the data, and WT, the vector that we are trying to learn, uh, is going to be greater than T gamma. Um, before we, Before I just uh say anything else about that here's the intuitive way of understanding that after there is um what is the dot product the dot product is essentially like talking about the angle between vectors and it, it depends on the angle between vectors the dot product increasing can okay, so dot product of u transpose of u transpose wt i can write it as the norm of u the norm of WT times the cosine of the angle between them. This is like a, uh, I was introduced to dot products that way, uh, but maybe some of you have seen dot products in other ways, but hopefully all of you have seen this somewhere. I see a few heads nodding, so maybe all of you have seen it somewhere. Now we know that this quantity is one, so I, I can get rid of that. Okay, what we're seeing is after T mistakes, this increases linearly with T. Which means as the number of mistakes increases, the dot this quantity keeps increasing. Which means the product of these two keeps increasing. Right? Okay, that's the first thing. The product of W and the cosine of the angle keeps increasing. Now it can happen. What does it mean when the cosine of the angle increases? When it the cosine of the angle goes to when can it be the highest? Cosine is highest when it's one, which means the two things are basically parallel to each other. Cosine of zero is one. So that's nice. If the two vectors are parallel to each other, then learning is done. We found the true weight vector. But there's a problem. All we know is this quantity is increasing, meaning that it's possible that the cosine is increasing, or maybe this quantity is increasing. That's one of those two is increasing, maybe both. That's where the second term comes in play. We know that as t increases, it doesn't increase too much. As t increases, the norm of WT square is less than t times r square. It's kind of bounded after a point. It, so it's not going to increase. Oh, no, this is a square root. So the norm of WT is less than R times the square root of T. The norm of WT increases only as a square root. But this quantity is increasing linearly. Which means after a point, the cosine of the angle has to catch up. This is an intuitive understanding of what's going on. Uh, this is a version that some people like and some people absolutely hate. So I'll present to you the version that works for everyone, which is just algebra. Okay. From the first, from the second inequality, I know that R times the square root of T is greater than the norm of WT. I just reversed it and took the square root on both sides. Now, 
I know I, I can also, we, we, I mean, we can also see that the norm of WT is going to be greater than U transpose WT. Why? Because U transpose WT is the norm of U, norm of WT cosine of an angle. This quantity is one, and this quantity is less than one. So this, the norm of WT is going to be greater than the dot product of U and WT. If you find this to be a rather simplistic explanation and you want a fancy name, it's basically an application of the Cauchy-Schwarz theorem or the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. If that means nothing to you, let's work with the cosines. Okay, but we know something about this expression here. That expression is greater than T gamma from the first claim. Okay, so I, I set up a chain of inequalities here. But notice the first and the last expression in inequality. They depend on nothing. They don't depend on the Ws and the Us. So I can just combine these two things. So I have R times square root of T is greater than or equal to T gamma. Well, I can divide, I can just move things around. R divided by gamma is greater than or equal to square root of T or T is less than or equal to R square by gamma square. But that's weird. The thing on the right, R square, first of all, um, I just have a cleaner version of that here. But this expression is weird. The farther side says R square over gamma square. That is the property of the data that we have, of how, how far the points are, how close the positive and the negative examples are. And the left-hand side does not depend on the data at all. It's just a property of the algorithm. How many mistakes does it make? Because this is after T mistakes. And the number of mistakes is bounded by an expression that doesn't depend on anything but the property of the data. Which means as far as if you are given a data set, the right-hand side is a constant. So this means that this algorithm, this quantity, the number t, cannot grow beyond r square over gamma square. And r square over gamma square is simply a property of the data. In other words, what we have is a bound on the number of mistakes that the perceptron can make. The perceptron algorithm cannot make more than r square over gamma square mistakes because it, it does, one of these inequalities will be broken. And we know that all of them are correct. Questions? Any questions from anyone about what we've done here? Yeah. How do I get the square of these here? So I had, so from these two, I was able to say R times square root of T is greater than T gamma. So I cancel this. This becomes the square root of t. And then I divide by gamma here. So I get this expression. So this, and then I take this uh, square on both sides. Yes. Gamma is the property of the data set. It's a property of the data set because it dictates how far is the, it's the margin. Exactly. We saw the margin before. It's exactly the margin. Other questions? Yes. Why don't we know? What do you mean? Why don't what? Why don't know why the, the normalized. We never normalize the weights of W. I mean, the proof also does not care about the weights of W. So the algorithm doesn't care about the weights of the W either. In uh, there are certain variants of the algorithm where the weights are normalized after every step, and uh, that leads to actually interesting properties of its own. And, but in practice, I've played with both versions and I found that it doesn't really matter. It's just one extra step and the computer does extra work, why bother? Let's go back to this sequence of arguments. So I said the proof was simple. The proof is actually simple because it does not involve anything, any sort of complicated math. It's just a very, very clever argument 
that uh, you need to kind of internalize and kind of work out and appreciate uh, offline to be able to kind of reconstruct. It's a very clever argument. So, and you know, the per person who invented the perceptron did not have the theorem in mind when he invented it. The perceptron was invented in 1958. The theorem was proved in 1962. Or at least for the perceptron, it was proved in 1962. It turns out the theorem existed in a different context uh, in the 1950s, early 50s, but uh, it was not for uh, learning. So let's revisit the mistake bond. And I want to kind of uh, give you the flame. You've seen these symbols enough now that this statement hopefully doesn't look intimidating. What we have here is uh, if you have a sequence of examples, uh, of training examples, where every uh, example has a label, which can be minus one or one, and every example has a bounded norm, it li lies in a ball of size R. And suppose this data is linearly separable with a unit vector u whose margin to the, for the data is gamma. Then the perceptron mistake bound theorem says, if you run the perceptron algorithm on this data, after R square over gamma square mistakes, there will be no more mistakes on the data. R, the, the, the radius of the data, actually depends on the dimensionality. So, in fact, if you, uh, uh, if you have higher dimensional data, if you have more features, R can get bigger. In, in particular, if you have Boolean features of the kind that we've been exploring, prove to yourself later on as an exercise that uh, R square is equal to the number of features you have. So as the number of features increases, the number of mistakes you make is also going to increase. Or the, the, not the number of mistakes will increase, the number of mistakes can increase. Gamma is a property of the also a property of the data, but in the sense that it's a property of the true classifier that separates the data. I'm, go I'm going to leave you with a bunch of exercises of, uh, I think, increasing difficulty that uh, I encourage you to uh, uh, sort of work with. If you have a disjunction with n features, you can, you should be able to apply the perceptron mistake bond, which means you need to calculate what is R, you need to calculate what gamma. But to calculate gamma, you need to be able to uh, think of what is the true weight vector that classifies a disjunction. And you can ask what's the, what's the perceptron mistake bond. Try it out. If you have questions, come to office hours, we can talk about it. Similarly, you can also talk about k disjunctions. K disjunctions have, if you have n features and only k of them are relevant, you can uh, ask how many mistakes, what's the, the maximum number of mistakes the perceptron algorithm will make. Um, once again, you need to calculate r and gamma. I've already shown you that R square is n. You need to essentially find gamma. For that, you need to find the true weight vector and the margin. Uh, a much harder question is uh, to con invent a sequence of examples that forces the perceptron to make those many mistakes. Maybe you got lucky and just accidentally learned the classifier without making those many mistakes, but I want you to invent that. Let's take a step back. Um, if R square is equal to N and uh, gamma can also be like a, essentially like a one over a polynomial in N, that means the number of mistakes is going to be polynomial in N, polynomial in the dimensionality. Remember a few lectures ago when we were talking about mistake bound learning? And I said, uh, a, 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 a concept is called mistake bound learnable. It is said to be learnable in the mistake bound if there exists an algorithm that can learn it, making only a polynomial number of mistakes um, in the a polynomial in the dimensionality. These two exercises are going to ask you to prove essentially that uh, the perceptron algorithm can be seen as that algorithm that makes only a polynomial number of mistakes on disjunctions, on k, on did I say k disjunctions, k disjunctions, and so on. But Weirdly enough, it is not operating in the space of disjunctions or k disjunctions. It's operating with real numbers. It's operating with weight vectors and it's using the geometry of the feature space rather than trying to think of them as Boolean functions. It doesn't even know they are Boolean functions. It's just trying to find a separator. 
So this was an example of where the concept is a Boolean function, but the learner is operating with something else. The good news is that uh, the date, the perceptron algorithm makes no assumptions about the distribution of the data. After making those many mistakes, we're done. Learning is done. It doesn't matter. We, the, the, uh, let me uh, say this in a different way. After making those many mistakes, it doesn't matter what new example comes along. If the original weight vector was able to separate it, this feature vector, this weight vector is also going to separate it, which is an incredible claim. We don't need to see any more data, but we can make a statement about the future. We can make a statement about whether this model is going to be correct after making those many mistakes, right? So there's no uh, there's no assumption about the examples are presented in this order. There is no sort of uh, niceness about assumption about nature. Nature can be adversarial. Nature can present the examples in the hardest possible sequence, and yet if nature forces the perceptron learner to make those many mistakes, nature loses the game. The concept is learned. I'm assuming that nature is being adversarial, so it doesn't want to teach the concept, but maybe that's not a good metaphor. On the other hand, there's a problem. This theorem had started off with an assumption. Suppose there was a unit vector that perfectly separated the data, then the perceptron algorithm will find it. Well, suppose there was no such unit vector. Suppose the real data was not linearly separable, as is the case in most real data sets. Well, in that case, what that means is we can't really hope for um, this fixed number of mistakes anymore. We may end up making more mistakes, and then we can we have to think about what to do next. What to do next might be invent more features, try uh, feature transformations, try to learn new features for the data. Um, and if you really don't care, just use averaging. Average perceptron tends to work better because it finds a slightly better weight vector. What you need to know about this is you need to know what the perceptron mistake bound is. You need to have an intuitive understanding of it. And you need to be able to prove the mistake bound for the perceptron. And maybe, you know, mild variance of the perceptron, maybe for a midterm, I might ask you to prove the mistake bound for another algorithm that doesn't look like the perceptron, but behaves in a similar way. And so you need to generalize. You need to generalize, just like the, your algorithm need to. Questions? Questions about the mistake bound? Questions about its implications. Yes. Right. You mean your data? So, so let me restate the question. The question was here we assume that the data is linearly separable and we are able to show if the data is linearly separable, learning will succeed. Is this going to be a feature of the rest of the semester? In every case, you're going to make some ridiculous assumptions about the data that never hold and then show that we can win. Um, not always. Um, in particular, we will talk about other learning algorithms and other sort of analyses tools that talk about uh, that that address the situation of what if your true classifier does not even belong to the concept does not even belong to the set of classifiers that nature used how bad could things be and uh, that particular setting is called agnostic learning agnostic learning is where your learner is agnostic of whether the true concept belongs to the hypothesis space or not and it turns out we can prove certain theorems, but we'll have to make other kinds of assumptions. We have to make certain other assumptions about niceness of the hypothesis space, for example. In general, no theorem comes without assumptions. I mean, every theorem is of the firm. If certain properties hold, then I can say something. I think this wraps up our uh, unit on perceptron. Uh, it's an online learning algorithm. Uh, it's I say it's very widely used. Increasingly, it is uh, uh, used as like almost a baseline because there are other models that are more expressive. In particular, something called the multi-layer perceptron, which is basically perceptrons on top of perceptrons. Uh, but the perceptron is a fantastic building block for you to know. It's like uh, a good 
sort of a bread and butter algorithm for you to uh, use as a first thing to try. It's easy to implement, which is why I asked you to implement like four of them. Um, it has an interesting property in that the way it's, it's, an, it's an example of an algorithm uh, of an additive update algorithm. What that means is the weights are being um, so you are adding something here. There are other algorithms which are not additive but multiplicative where the weights are updated by multiplying them with something. We are not going to, unfortunately, we're not going to see an example of such an algorithm, but if you care, there's a there are slides on an algorithm called Wino, which is a multiplicative weight update algorithm, which has really interesting properties. But uh, it is used far less than perceptron for reasons I'm not entirely sure. The nice thing about the perceptron algorithm is that it has a fairly intuitive geometric interpretation. The idea is that we are rotating the weight vector so that the, the it becomes, it, it it makes its mistake, it's not making as much of a mistake as before. And the other really, really neat thing about the perceptron is that it comes with a mistake bound. Very few algorithms that we'll see in the class come with a theorem that says you'll never make mistakes anymore. So the perceptron comes with that mistake bound. And there are many, many practical variants and you should be able to implement it. You should be able to implement its variants. You should be able to think about its variants. You should know about the concept of margins. Uh, and how it impacts the difficulty of learning to be able to prove the mistake box. Any questions about any of this?